Thank you to Synergy and to everyone here for uh, the next hour and the, the opportunity to kind of come and talk about who Amera is and introduce us a little bit. Um, I'm not sure, Amera is the newest kid in the block kind of thing from an environmental perspective in the province. Although it's been talked about for quite some time and I'll, I'll just chat on that briefly in a minute. Um, it is still a relatively new organization and we're just still building up. But in essence, our mandate that has been legislated to us under the Protecting Alberta's, uh, Protecting Alberta's Environment Act that was passed back in December of 2012, um, then enacted, uh, or was talked about in 2012, passed in 2013, and then we were actually proclaimed and created as an agency just last year. So just in building up, we're a brand new agency, but we've got a pretty important mandate. Let's try to step back so I'm not popping there. Um, is anybody, have, are you familiar with, who has heard of Amera before? And who has not heard of Amera before? 50-50, okay. So it is a long name. It is the name that was created under the legislation in, in establishing this, the Alberta Environmental Monitoring Evaluation and Reporting Agency. Um, we're a science-based organization. We don't have any role in policy or regulatory um, direct involvement in doing that. So we're, again, kind of a new cat, and we haven't been able to find any other organization like us around the world. So we're sort of making things up as we go along. Who is Amera? It's governed by a board of directors that was established upon proclamation. And uh, Jane Agendron, who was a long time um, rep or worked within the government as an assistant deputy minister with Alberta Environment and then worked in the oil sands region and then had actually retired, has come back and is now uh, our president and CEO. Dr. Fred Rona is our chief scientist. Um, he comes with a lot of credentials having worked with Environment Canada, but he's really more of a, a, one of the best known water scientists in the water communities around the world. Bill Donahue, somebody you might know, of worked in a lot of communities through this region as well, is a uh, wild, or, uh, pardon me, a water and a fish guy, and he comes at it. He's taken on our monitoring role. Um, myself, and you've heard a bit about my background, and then Shirley Fossum, who has got uh, a high level of kind of our corporate side of things to be able to help build us and create us as an agency. We're a small agency. Um, we're about 90 people and growing, and when I say we're growing, I mean we're hiring right now, specifically on the science capacity. One of the things that was recognized in the creation of Amera is that there wasn't really a strong science focus that was being taken to a lot of the, um, there's a lot of monitoring activities that were going on, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of evaluation. And the lack of science has kind of dwindled down over the year, uh, several years from a government perspective. So Amera was kind of created to start to fill that void to be able to bring back the science into the monitoring, evaluation, and reporting of environmental conditions in the province. So we've got about 40 staff that are now sort of more of the scientists and then on the reporting side, and I'll talk about all of these things a, a lot through my presentation. But we also um, are inheriting and bringing across a lot of the people who have been doing monitoring within the province for the, the Alberta Environment and Parks now that they were out doing the field work of doing that. So we're actually located out in various locations around the province. And again, we'll be growing to about 120 to 150 people over the next, next six to eight months. Amera was kind of created, popping is driving me crazy, sorry. Amera was kind of created at uh, a time, a lot of people looking back on it kind of said it was a little bit of a public relations exercise because at the time, the province was really kind of getting a lot of international pressure around its reputation around the oil sands. It was also getting some pressure, like starting to build up. It was the early stages of the, the Keystone discussions. So, you know, Alberta was getting that reputation for the tar sands and th that <coughs> reputation around dirty oil. So it was kind of born a little bit out of that from that perspective. But more importantly, I think when you look back on it, I, I, we, I, I believe that there was a lot of foresight that was shown in doing that. So whatever the reasons that were the motivation for doing it, I think that there's a great opportunity for the province to really make a difference. And there's certainly a demand for the information that we're producing and we're starting to provide. So Amera was created in a condition because there is, with all the rapid development that was happening and the need for kind of the credible information and, and that coming forward, and there's a higher level of public expectation now. Everybody's got a, a cell phone. Everybody in this room has probably got at least one cell phone on them, 
and is checking in real time, you're tweeting in real time, and the internet now has all kinds of information that's on it. How do you actually sort through and decipher what's the trust, most trusted, credible source of doing things? And people are taking the same pieces of data and information and then finding different ways to interpret it and come back to it. And so a question was you know, talked about earlier this morning is where's the science to be able to support these things? So people are starving for knowledge. And this is uh, an environment where people really are becoming much more sophisticated and wanting to seek out their own knowledge, but they don't know what are all the different sources you need to compare to and how do you be able to, to develop that. Um, emerging technologies are also helping to be able to increase how em environmental monitoring is happening. There are um, dozens of organizations and entities in this province, many of which are represented in this room, that are currently engaged in environmental monitoring to varying degrees, monitoring and evaluation, and to reporting to a lesser extent. But the system that was created or that we've kind of come out of of the last 20 to 30 years of how it's evolved out is uh, a couple of challenges. The monitoring has only been done from the perspective of within specific mediums. So traditionally, science looks at things like air, water, land, and biodiversity or wildlife health as a, an indicator, uh, flora and fauna health as an indicator for that. So in that context, it's not necessarily ever been designed in terms of how monitoring programs have been done by governments around the world, not just in Canada and not just in Alberta, but there's been a very medium specific kind of focus to it over the last couple of decades. Cumulative effects is now starting to become much more of a demand. And what are the impacts? You cannot distance water from what the impacts are now on land and soil, or that land and soil have in water, as we're learning from things like the cows and fish program in the province, where you're looking at things that are happening from a farming perspective, impacts on the land. And the higher pace of development just accelerates the needs to uh, us to understand how those things interact together. In addition to that, though, and probably more importantly, is why AMERA was established and why it's going to be a challenge for us to grow further is because we're in an environment where a lot of monitoring was being done, but there wasn't necessarily a lot of scientific evaluation to all of the data that was coming in. We're swimming in data, but we, what we don't have is context or understanding as to what that data means. So what it is, is there's been so much work and there is so much data that's out there in so many different areas that says that what is happening to the environment. What is not being explained is, so what? What does that mean? What are the implications of it? What are the causes of it? What do we need to stop doing? What do we need to start doing? Because that, that, that then leads to the now what? So our space from Amera's perspective is to be able to now build up, not just take the what, it's to harness all the what and to be the aggregator of it, as well as the gatherer of some components of it. But where it's really gonna make a difference is that we're gonna be doing the interpretation and the evaluation where the majority of our people are going to be bringing into and coming from Amera and where we're doing the majority of our hiring is around the now what, or the, the, the so what, the evaluation piece. And then more importantly, and the part that I'm directly involved in, is then making sure that that information is available. So it needs to be lots of, lots of information that's out there. So the data that's there, help us understand it, make it available, make it accessible, make it relevant, make it understandable. So. Lots of data, but we need knowledge. Very quickly, just I, I mentioned that how Amera kind of came about. It was driven out of the Alberta oil sands area, and there was various panel reports that were done that kind of created, I won't go into the full detail of the different stages, but it was many years of discussion and looking at things. And it finally culminated in 2013 with the management board report that gave very specific direction in terms of creating the agency that then led into the legislation that led into our creation. We were also created into this context of the integrated management resource system. Um, now with the IRMS system is the government is trying to move in a direction from a policy perspective to look at that responsible resource stewardship. So they're looking at it in the context of trying to shift and lead this shift of doing things. And I can tell you of, of having to work in this is that it's very difficult to take a very broad like, group of parties. Now you've got the regulator that's in there that integrated resource management also led to the creation of the uh, energy regulator to a certain extent with that legislation um, and the separation out of those responsibilities. It is intended 
and the outcomes of what an IRMS system is, is doing is, is it shifts it to be very outcome focused. The reality is it is not an easy thing to do though because you've got 30 to 40 years of kind of entrenched approaches very similar to the way that the mediums have been done from a science perspective. You've also got that from how government, how policy and how entities are organized and structured. But the attempt is there, the system is there, there is a processes in place to start moving towards this and we're all trying to work together from the different perspectives of how it's being done. Place-based approach, so it is based within the, the regional context as well. The shift in the system, simply put, it, it really just looks at, it, re it clearly recognizes the need to manage cumulative effects and that it clearly needs and recognizes that there, or recognizes there needs to be a way to address the growing demands and expectations of the public. It needs to be looked at and it needs to be open and transparent. Again, not without its challenges to get to that because that's, government doesn't necessarily take that approach. It's much more careful of doing things, which is why the system is kind of, a, it's a challenge to be able to move in this direction. But it's starting because there used to be a project by project regulation and allocation, and it's trying to move to looking at it in a broader perspective. Not there yet, but we're putting all the building blocks and pieces. And the government is putting the building blocks and pieces, and one of those building blocks is AMERA. Implementation of the IRMS system is through the regional land use plans. So if you think that the regional land use plans have actually, there's actually only two in the province, one of which is a little more advanced in the lower Athabasca regional plan, and then the one um, that just came out a couple of years ago with the South Saskatchewan regional plan. And we're just doing the first reporting back on that this current year. So those are still quite new. There's processes in place and, and reaching out to be able to create the ones in the, the five other regions. But it's still early days in terms of how that's doing. There's a lot of flagship work that's being done up in the oil sands region around the lower Athabasca. Not perfect, learning a lot of lessons in the process, but they, it needs to be able to evolve to, to look at these different things. So what the land use frameworks do is, of course, put in where there's triggers, limits, and indicators of what need to be looked at from an environmental perspective. Um, from where Amera sits, coming new to the game and to the party on that, when we look at that, there's a lot of indicators we need to get and take data and be able to shift those indicators. So again, growing field, where it needs to go. But the intention is that there's an adaptation to these emerging trends and to be able to look at this. Our work is designed to inform decision making. So if our work is just science for the sake of science, it's not having any value to it. So having a context and a purpose to it within this framework is, is helping at least give the creation or some traction to our organization. Um, ongoing monitoring. So where does, how does this fit? And I don't know if anyone's seen this graphic before, but I think that this is the best way to explain the intention of what the RMS system is about, is that it is sort of that plan, do, check cycle. So if you think of the government's role in this, and there are four core government departments that sit at the table within trying to pull this together, and it's of course uh, Alberta Environment and Parks, Alberta Energy, um, Alberta uh, Forestry, Agriculture and Forestry, and um, now Aboriginal rela Relations as well. Those four government departments, their role is to set policy. They've created the regulator under the Responsible Energy Act to be able to create and have that as the implementer. So if you think of that, that's where the implementation is, they've tried to separate that. Now there's a review that's currently underway that we'll look at exactly to help tighten up and better define the roles and responsibilities between those two, but that's the intention of how that's to be able to be done so that the policy is separated from the implementation, um, but there's still a connection that you're communicating. Then Amera's role, although the check part of it is broken into two pieces, and this is, I think, this is the area where the current government is, is just looking at from a review perspective. They're looking at our mandate as well, just to tighten it up as we're starting to move forward within this, is that we currently don't do the compliance or the source monitoring. Ours is more designed at the ambient. It's looking at the broader indicators. It's looking at the impact on the environment. It is the, the, the non-point source of pollution that's out there. And when you think of ambient, it's anything, in, as soon as you step outside a door, that's ambient monitoring, anything outside of a building or anything that's not caused by any kind of human-driven activity. But it's the implications of those human-driven activities is what we're designed to monitor. Oops. Our specific role is to be able to, to provide that credible source of that information on a regular basis. 
Um, and I really can't emphasize enough that I think that our success or failure is going to come across on the timeliness and the transparency of it. We've spoken at a number of different um, stakeholder events and with a number of different groups and saying that we're intended, the, the key difference that's going to come is on that reporting side, not just the evaluation, but it's also going to be the reporting. So in the past, there are lots of government reports. I used to work in government. I know there's tons of information and there's things that sit on the shelf that never see the light of day. And that's what decisions are based on. So it's frustrating on the government side when, you know, as a person that you know that this information's there, but it's not necessarily being released or it hasn't been released, it's sat on because they want to be able to come up with the policy at the end of the day before you get to that point. Um, you, you know that the information's there, you know where the policy is going, but there's so much process that has to go through. What we're designed to do, we've yet to have a, te a test of this, but the information that we're providing out, if we're doing a state of the environment report, we'll be releasing it to the public at the same time that we're releasing it to government so that it's not going to be sitting on the shelf because otherwise trust is built on the timeliness and the availability of that information. Trust doesn't come and part of what it is, there's been very good work in science and the data that's out there is not bad data from what's been collected over the years. But the fact that the messenger then comes out and it comes out two to three years after the data has been collected is that people are now looking and saying they don't trust the source. They feel that that time lapse has made it been manipulated or there's a specific purpose or it's being released in the context of different things. Amera's role is to be able to bring that out. And because we don't have any role directly in, in changing the policy or creating the policy, we certainly can inform and provide recommendations related to it. But because we don't have any kind of a legislative role in that, we're independent, we're based in science and evidence, um, it's designed within the system that we should have that objective and hopefully over time build up some trust to get the information. But again, that trust is only going to come through the transparency and the availability of the information. So our long-term vision is to do just that, is to become known as and recognized as um, the comprehensive and trusted source of environmental data, information that results in a better understanding and decision-making about Alberta's environment. So the information and the second part of our vision is just as important as the front because this, it has to be relevant and it has to be known. You have to think of us as the top of mind thing of doing things. Again, I keep stressing and, and was even just, we're having a conversation earlier and I just was saying, we're still, this is very new. And we haven't been able to have any other examples to be able to deal with, to, to look at and to hold up and to be able to model after. So we're creating a lot of new models as we're going along the way. And we're building and changing some paradigms within government. Amera doesn't represent the transition just of handing off of a lot of the environmental monitoring responsibilities. It represents the transformation of the system within that integrated resource management system. That's a transformation of how we're going to be looking at environmental monitoring moving forward and given the opportunity of some time and some resources and working with stakeholders, we'll be able to hopefully do that. Mission, pretty straightforward. On a day-to-day -day basis, this is what our staff are doing, measuring, assessing, and informing on the conditions of Alberta's environment. So I mentioned that as an arm's length agency, and the arm's length nature just comes that we are created under an act of the Alberta legislature, um, and we do have public funding. Our funding source comes from two primary areas. One is um, funding that comes directly under a regulation that's collected through the government from the, on the oil sands, and it's primarily collected from the oil and gas industry in that region. Um, as well as then we also get some funding as a line item out of the Alberta Environment and Parks budget. So this is our first year of full operations of doing that. We just actually even moved into an office that's outside of government offices at this point in time to start to be able to move to that arm's length status. So as we're moving from a financial connection and doing that, our accountability is still there. That's our arm's length relationship. But because we have a board of directors with a very clear mandate, and there is a mandate and rules document that clearly distinguishes our roles, it's available on our website, that clearly distinguishes the roles of what Amera does and where and when we're accountable back to the government. And a lot of that doesn't relate to when we're releasing information. What it relates to is more the financial management of public funds. So that's the key area where we need to have that high level of accountability, both to the minister and to the legislature, depending on how the funding comes to us. 
Um, there was, for people who may have heard of Amera before, um, you know, some early media coverage, and a lot of people do talk about and say that we're industry funded. Um, we're, we get funding that is given to government for industry to a specific purpose, but we don't have direct funding or a direct connection with industry. So just as, um, you know, government does provide us with some funding, so I think that there is potentially a risk from a public perspe perception perspective that our funding is tied to from a government perspective. But the funding that does come from industry is completely, our, our chief financial officer doesn't like me saying this, but it's sort of laundered through government, <laughs> is that it does go through a step process of where the funding does get collected. We develop the work plans. We provide that work plan to government. Government then sends basically the levy or the, the amount out to the industry and then industry pays it. It comes back to us through government. So there isn't any kind of a direct connection that industry has any direct influence. They have as much influence as a member of the public, as any landowner that we deal with or anybody else that we're gonna be engaging with. And that's gonna be kind of the focus of where I'm talking about for the next little while. So as a result though, we're creating an entity that is not government, that is very much science-based. We're trying to attract thinkers and people who are then working in this field that they do not feel, they're not thinking in a, in a policy context, they are looking at the data and they are making evaluations and they are looking at the science and they are doing the research and ask, answering the questions that need to be answered. And then subsequently, the, the people that work in my group are very much focused on making sure it's available, looking at cutting edge ways of getting the information out there, looking at the knowledge translation component, which is the key area that we're really building up on to be able to help translate and help you understand that knowledge from a graphics perspective, from an understanding, from a context perspective, from a regional perspective, all of those different pieces. So the values that we're creating and how we're doing and designing to attract people are very much collaborative, creative, balanced, passionate about what you do, and respectful, of course, to anybody in the relationships we're doing. And I did say at one staff event last year is that we're, that values for an organization are, are designed to hire or fire people. That's, you attract those people of doing that. And that's, as we've evolved and coming out of government, all good people, but just didn't necessarily understand the values of what we were trying to achieve. So there were some people that opted to stay back within government because they just weren't ready to be challenged and work in that direction. Strategic priorities. So one of the first things that the board of directors did over the past year was to establish a strategic plan to say, where are we going? If you don't understand where you're going, then you're just gonna be wandering around lost and, and not having any kind of focus to what's kind of the approach. So within the strategic plan, um, they sat down last September and they focused on um, what are the key things that will lead us to becoming the most comprehensive, trusted, credible, recognized source of, of environmental data from that perspective. So it's all these sort of focusings. It's, and and this, if you're looking at it from a circular perspective, you start with the science. Because everything we do starts with the science and the understanding of what are the questions we need to under, what are the questions we need to answer and then what's the construct of how we're gonna answer them so that we can trust the answer we get at the end of the day. Information management is related to dissemination. Organizational capacity is our ability and if we got the right people and the right resources to be able to do it. And organizational capacity then leaps over to funding a bit too because like everybody else these days, it's a sustainable funding model that we need to have sustainable and independent funding model that we need to have to be able to be successful and to be able to achieve our objectives. Stakeholder engagement, significant component, and then the products and services as to what we put out on the street and be able to, to share with information that you can have access to. So this is kind of a, a hard model to see with some of the small print, but it is available on our website as well. Um, but this is what our business value chain looks like. So if you look at how it comes in, everything starts and ends kind of with that point or the point you're coming into it with the user groups. It's understanding the needs of what all of the people who could possibly have questions about the environment of doing things, which is a pretty big task when, you put it, when I put it that way. So trying to break it down into very specific user groups, looking at the individuals like uh, communities, non-governmental organizations, policymakers, academic researchers, regulatory bodies, private citizens, and then operations staff. So people who are out in the field doing things, whether it's from a parks perspective or a conservation officer, um, oil and gas, somebody out in the oil and gas field, something like that. People are actually in the field that need the data and being able to have access to that. 
So understanding what the questions are on that front end being asked in helps design what we're monitoring. Are we monitoring the right things? And I remember, because um, I, I, I did some consulting with Amera prior to uh, applying and coming in to be a staff person. I remember some of the early discussions when they were getting organized was just to, the, the very first thing was, are we even asking the right questions? Are we even using the right parameters? Are we looking at the right indicators and triggers? And as I'm learning from my science colleagues around the table is that in some cases, yes, and in some cases, no. There certainly is lots of room for continuous improvement and to make things better and moving forward. And we gotta get the right people to be able to help us do that. The monitoring then, Everything you can't evaluate unless you've got good data, but the data has to be designed. I mean, the evaluation component and what you're monitoring and what data you're pulling in has to fit with the design. So Fred and Bill are taking a perspective where it's an integrated approach. It's not, he's in, um, Bill's in one silo looking at the monitoring and Fred's in another silo looking at just taking whatever he's producing. They're working and designing those programs together so that it's a holistic look at it and it's outcome focused. It's focused on the outcomes again. What are the questions that people are asking? What do you need to know about the environment? Some components will be from an academic perspective, more on the science side. So you need to have more scientific answers to the questions. And some will be more on the public side. Or as Einstein said, if you can't explain it to your grandmother, then you don't understand the science yourself. So the final piece then is that dissemination of it. Because if you don't complete the circle of coming around to it, Again, as I said earlier, um, the current system, and I think the frustration with some people, including the government with the current system, is that it doesn't necessarily have the data and all the information that's out there. Again, I, I can't stress enough that there's a lot of monitoring going on in this province. And I think that the groundwater example is one of the ones that is probably one of the most significant is that so many people have pieces of data. And when I worked in the government 10, 12 years ago, that data was all over the place and we were talking about doing a groundwatering, groundwater monitoring plan to be able to figure out and capture all the pieces of data, whether it's from an individual landowner, from an oil and gas company, from a regional municipality, um, from a, you know, water, or like a company like an EPCOR or an NMAX or something like that. People have all these different pieces of data, but it's not shared and it's not available in one place. So it's pockets of information where people need it from a localized perspective but we don't have a really great overview of what the province looks like. Now, a lot of work's been done in the last few years to be able to do like flyovers and to be able to do some mapping and some modeling and looking at it that way. But I think that some of the concerns that I've just heard even in the room this morning, you really need to get a much better comprehensive picture of those sorts of things. So that's sort of the work being able to come across and how those things fit together, but it's having that information available to you. The information may be out there, you need to have it available when you need it, when you want it. So from our strategic plan, we now go down to our business plan. And I'm not going to give you the big, long, here's our business plan. It is available on our website. Um, but um, and in case you hadn't figured out by the name of our organization, it's amera.org. That's our website as well. So in that, there's kind of four things for our first year of full operations that we're trying to do. Again, the past year, really was just about getting things pulled together, getting an organization, being able to hire staff as a starting point, lots of administrative stuff that had to happen behind the scenes because um, Amera was the first agency, new agency to be created in the government of Alberta in about 20 years. And you can say, oh, you know, they created this and this, but they were always, always building off of an infrastructure of an existing organization or entity. Amera did not. We started basically from scratch other than a few people kind of coming over to us. Again, until t yesterday, we didn't even have our own offices to be able to operate a year later, year and a half later. So there's four core goals. One is based on the science and being able to get, build up the capacity from a science perspective to be able to move forward. Two is about the um, timely and understandable reporting. What are we actually gonna be doing to get in that direction? Three is about really building strong relationships um, with Aboriginal communities and getting a really meaningful understanding of traditional knowledge within the context of our science. That's one of the mandates, or one of the key parts of our mandate that was established in creating us and trying to move past that too in a context where it's been primarily related to duty to consult, we're, we're now working on a much broader platform and I'll talk about that in a minute. And then finally, sustainable funding. And again, I think that's something that every organization can relate to right now, but when you are reliant on public funding, 
and you are looking at a broad mandate, it's how do you pull all those pieces together to make sure that you're not going to have your funding cut next year. You invest in programs. Science is for the long haul. You need to look at the, the, the more, the older data is from an environmental perspective, the more valuable that data is. Because you've got the comparative, you can start to see the trends. You need the snapshots of things that are happening like an air quality at this moment today. But to be able to get context and understanding as to what it means, you need to be able to look back to see the cycles of it. And you see that happening in the debate around climate change. Not debate, discussion around climate change of how that is. But trying to understand what's real and what's not in that environment is, it can be difficult if you don't have that comprehensive data that you can look back on and make a reasonable um, view from your perspective at. A little small to see, but um, it is doing this. We are um, starting with a, a governance model that is um, kind of changing of how people have been engaged. So going back to that value-driven wheel that, that I, I showed you in doing things, um, just as everything starts and ends on the science, everything also starts and ends on the information is only as good as the people who are going to use it or the value of, of it to the consumer, whether you are a consumer as a policy um, and decision maker in government, or you are a soccer mom determining whether or not your child with asthma is safe for them to go play soccer tonight because the air, there's smoke in the air. So there's the whole range of doing that. So, but if the information isn't presented and available to you in that context, so we need to understand what are the questions that you have about the environment. Because we work within at the RMS table, we under, we're getting a better understanding all the time of the questions that government needs to. They're kind of saying to us, is, this is the starting point of the policies that exist. These are the land use, or the regional land use plans that are in place that we need to look at. What's the next step beyond that? So as we mature and we build up our science capacity, we're gonna be able to help influence that. But it all starts with what's the question that needs to be answered. So within that, we're building the relationships with stakeholders across the province within that context. And again, we're in very early days of doing that and we're gonna be coming out later this year to talk about exactly what that approach is because we are actually talking to stakeholders right now about how do we go about doing this. And when, if any in this room goes, you haven't talked to me, it's because we've really been primarily focused in the oil sands region as a starting point. We inherited a program called the Joint um, Oil Sands, Joint Implementation Plan between Canada and Alberta for oil sands monitoring. And that's where the funding got established from a regulatory perspective. So in that process, there was a lot of engagement activities that were happening. And so we took the opportunity with Amera coming in with taking a leading role in that in the last year or so and sat back and said, okay, what worked and what didn't? And then we're trying to take that and broaden the model out over the province. So there will be much more activities as we get further established. We are working with the Alberta Air Shed Council to be able to bring together the air sheds to, to figure out how we work together with them. And, um, you know, I, I hope... We're making, and I'm optimistic that we're making some good progress, just to create a memorandum of understanding that will at least get us having a formal conversation together because we have a common outcome that we all are interested in doing, and that is knowing and better understanding and managing air quality in the province of Alberta. Likewise, um, we've had just very early discussions, but with WPACs, because everybody's a little different. All of these monitoring organizations kind of have a different governance, different um, role, different mandate, all of these things, how they come together. So we're trying to figure out of how we can then work, facilitate, aggregate, and pull together and empower all of these organizations under our, our, our legislated mandate. When we first came, there's a fly buzzing around here, good biodiversity in this room. So when we first came into being, a lot of people or a lot of organizations um, kind of thought Amero is a bit of a threat. They're just going to come in and take everything over because that's kind of the, the traditional government way um, that people have been accustomed to. And I'm not just saying Alberta government, just government, big G government. So with that, that's not our intention. I, I said earlier, we're only ever going to have like 120 to 150 people. So our role is really to take all of the work that's being done and help connect it more effectively, then evaluate it, and then report it. So all of the work that's being done, we want to leverage as best as possible, whether it's an academic institution and science researcher, or whether it's an air shed that's collecting, um, that has years of data and has been collecting information, or a WPAC that has a really good understanding of the local watershed. Because the thing about the environment is that at a, the closer you are to it, the better understanding you have to it. Which brings in the concept of traditional knowledge. 
is that traditional knowledge isn't just from Aboriginal like First Nations and Métis communities. It's also the traditional knowledge of a rancher or a farmer or um, someone who's been working or a community planner within a Drayton Valley that has looked and has a good understanding and has seen the trends over the year. That's a piece of knowledge that needs to be considered when you're looking at science. You shouldn't just strictly be looking at what the numbers and the data show you. You should be looking at also the context and the patterns and what we observe, the science of the eyes as much as the science of the paper. Um, Biodiversity Institute, I'm not sure if anyone is familiar with her, has worked with the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute. It's about 10, 13 years old as an organization, and it primarily focuses on biodiversity across the province. So we're looking at, at building and strengthening how we're going to be able to look at ecosystem health, not just biodiversity, but ecosystem health and, how, and wildlife, because those are major indicators of, of the overall health of your environment. Um, and this is of something, one of the things that we're going back to the questions is there's clearly, like we've been reporting on, and anytime there's been environmental information that's available, it's been uh, the air quality is this, the water is this, and all that. But what does it mean? And people want to know what it means right now for two reasons. What does it mean to my health? And what does it mean to the, like, the climate change? Because those, for different reasons, health is much more personal and closer to home individual, looking at it from that perspective, we all relate to it as human beings, and climate change because it is very much a discussion that's out there and we're making observations, again, of our eyes and our experience, that something's different or changing. Is this normal? Do we need to make adaptation? Do we make, need to stop doing things? Do we need to start doing things? All of those different things. Those are the two kind of public drivers that we're aware of that we need to be starting to answer better questions. So we have a lot of the data, but it hasn't necessarily been reported up and brought forward in those contexts. So those are two key areas of where we're focusing our science and monitoring planning right now. Again, I mentioned developing collaborative relationships with scientific and academic communities, not just within Alberta, in a variety of different locations around the world based on the science connections that um, our chief scientist and chief monitoring officer bring to the table. As well as then, this month, we're gonna have our first face-to-face -face meeting with an international science advisory panel who come from various disciplines, but clearly look at it from a data interpretation perspective. They're going to be, their role is to provide some oversight to make sure that the science we're doing is actually good and then to bring in. So, for example, a couple of members on that, the chair of it works for the U.S. Geological Survey. Um, there's a guy from the National Oceanographic, NOAA, what's I'm missing a no. <laughs> anyway, NASA, there's another NASA, <laughs> different perspectives. So they're coming with credentials and perspectives that are well respected and, you know, we, we took about seven months to do a good search together, make sure that we had the right individuals being able to provide that oversight. And just to say that we're doing it right or we're doing it wrong. Again, timely, understandable reporting. So what are we doing? Um, if you look at our website, amero.org, it's an early indication of where we're trying to go. Our first website that we had as an organization, like any organization, was all about Amera. This is what we're doing, this is who we are, we're pushing out this information. This is, come see us, this is our corporate structure, yada, yada. So where we've shifted in the last couple of months is to now be reporting on what's of interest to the public and what's of interest to you. It's a narrative, it's a story, it's the context. But with the under platform, right now it's a separate platform, but it's gonna be merging in the next several months where you can get the data from a spatial perspective. You can go in and click on the map and find out what the data is and coming in. It's not perfect yet, it's got a long way to go, and where we're evolving it to be is that it'll be a customizable dashboard that you can go into and set up to your parameters and you'll get the information and then you can set up to have that information pushed out to you in doing that. One of the key and most significant things that I like to highlight about where we're going, and again, not as far and as fast as I want it to be, but is the timeliness of it. You can go in and get air data in this province within 10 minutes. It's updated and refreshed all the time and validated within 24 hours. So, and the validation process is very important because you can get a blip. Um, there was an incident where there was a bat that was on one of the monitors that changed all of the, the, the data that came out at the end of the day. So it looked like there was a major spike at one station in Southern Alberta recently that then kind of threw everything off and looking at this. So, you have to be able to, to have the validation back. If there's an anomaly, it needs to be checked in doing that. So once it's validated. But it is, um, you know, a real-time process, 
a verified process, and then it becomes an archive process. And again, the information has got to be kept there. It's got to be kept in a way that you can find it and that the trends can go. So through that process, um, pulling all that stuff down, and you're going to see soon there's going to be uh, websites pardon me, billboards, the digital billboards all across the province, every digital billboard will start to have real-time air monitoring at the location that that's at. So that's just our first step of doing things. We're also talking to community newspapers of how we can reach out and be able to, to be able to have like some sort of ongoing state of the environment reporting once we get our science capacity built up. Aboriginal communities is another key part of what our role is, and that's really working to get, find the common ground we have a really strong common ground on the environment. We all care about the environment. We all want to understand it better. We all want to do the right thing. So with that in mind, looking at it, this is the conversation we're having. And one of the challenges is, is that Aboriginal, like First Nations and Métis communities, there's been a mistrust that's built up. This is about the whole truth and reconciliation. We're not government. Defining ourselves outside of government, we don't have any legislative or regulatory responsibilities. So we have no duty to consult but we have the need to involve and have these discussions. And further, we're trying to take traditional knowledge and pull it into our entities, like the organizations, as much as we can. To that end, we have appointed, similar to our science advisory panel, we have a traditional knowledge panel that meets for the first time this week. And it was a, it's a very different cat, <laughs> because again, it, you can't treat it the same way the science do. You have to respect traditional knowledge in a different way. And the best way it's been explained to me from some elders is that, like it's taken us, gen traditional knowledge is just that, it's based on traditions and understanding and generations. It's taken years to get this understanding and observation of the land. Whereas, um, you know, they said, so this is the knowledge that we have and you're asking us to give you this knowledge. Whereas how long does it take to understand how to look at a water sample and figure out what's wrong with it? Three weeks of training, two months, five years, something like that versus generations. So that there needs to be some trust and we need to respect and manage that knowledge effectively. So as a result, we're bringing in um, people who both have walked in both worlds, who understand from the academic side of the need to explain it and provide context to it, but also then have a respect and understanding of the spiritual and the cultural nature of the knowledge that they're sharing. And finally, I won't spend a lot of time in sustainable funding, but um, it is looking at the key point that I'd like to, to just note about what we're looking at from our sustainable funding model is it's not just a sustainable funding model for Amera, it's funding for the system. So our interest is in looking at making sure that we've got a longer term cycle to it. Um, as an agency, one of the greatest advantages that we bring is the fact that we do not have to and we are not restricted to um, um, government, the, the, okay, money has to be spent by March 31st. A portion of our funding, which is our core funding, which is our operational for our offices and our staffing and stuff, that does. But for the actual science work, because it falls under the regulation, it's collected in a longer way, we have the ability to carry it forward. So if it's a science project that takes two to three years, we're able to put that funding towards and make that commitment to it, and you don't have to then rush and spend or have that cut off or have that reporting to that. There's an annual reporting and accountability that will be to that funding, but we're able to look at the long-term view and the longer-term outcomes from that perspective. So, synergy. Um, I liked, I, I love the word synergy. I loved it before this entity. We, I, we had to, it worked with some, uh, the early days of Synergy Alberta too. Um, but it, it is very much working together in the collaborative nature of doing things. And, um, you know, the definition of synergy is really that it means working together and coming together. So, well, given another hour or so, I could talk about our specific exactly what we're doing with each of the individual sectors and the stakeholder groups. Um, we will be doing a, we'll have a, a multi-stakeholder forum that we're actually going to be talking about our relationships and where our consultation process is and how are we asking those questions. We're just in the processes, again, as a new agency of just designing what those will look like. But, um, you know, we want to be held accountable for making sure that we are asking you and bringing in that voice to the table. Because without understanding what's really important to people, even in serving the government in some of the questions that they need, we can't answer those questions effectively. We really need to understand what questions need to be asked and why they need to be asked. So we can understand how we need to report back and what's relevant about them. We really need to understand it at a regional, a local, regional, provincial, 
and then in a national context, and then hence in an international context, because the environment doesn't stop at borders. And that's even with the regional plan. That's just a construct to be able to organize and to look at, because that brings it down to a regional level. But from a broader perspective, we also be able, need to be able to look at it. So when you come to our website in a year to two years, ideally you'll be able to look at that information from your neighborhood all the way up to Western Canada in the context of the world. What does this mean? That's the goal, anyway. Um, specific stakeholder groups, we're doing a lot of work right now just to really define and understand who the people are in the province. So an organization um, like Synergy Alberta, where it brings people together like this, this is the sort of uh, entity and organization that we need to be working closely with, with all of you as individuals, as the organizations and companies you represent, as well as then, uh, and the communities you represent, as well as then rolling it forward. So because our mandate is to measure, incest and inform, um, just for the last few minutes, if you have any questions, I'd be happy to take any of them. So it was stated that uh, you do non-point ambient monitoring. Mm -hmm. um, obviously for your uh, evaluation purposes though, uh, I would assume you guys would be going in and checking to see um, sources of uh, pollution or right. uh, those sort of things. Where are you pulling uh, that data from particularly? We're actually right now um, trying to create like a, a working, we're, we're putting in a, a, like a, an agreement with AER right now to be able to, to look at the standards because we're inheriting a system of the way things have been and are collected and so we need to bring across the data that's doing that. So um, having very good discussions, um, at the, especially the science group to the science group, being able to look at things of how they move across. So just as they need our information, we need that information because it doesn't provide the full picture. Where there's a danger is that um, there still needs to be somebody, there needs to be almost a separate body, AR or whoever, to be able to collect the data from an industry perspective because that could be all consuming to the work that we do and then it could lose sight of the bigger picture. So um, we are, that's where the data is currently coming from. There are some other monitoring sources that come through government departments at present just because there's a lot of regulatory um, arrangements, agreements, and licenses that have been issued specifically uh, assigning or aligning it to specific organizations or entities, and that's just going to take some time to move forward in doing that. But we're working at the broader, higher level to get that information, and we do have access to all of that information on demand. Yes, oh. hello. I'm also speaking to the non-point source and ambient air quality monitoring. You mentioned the AER. Uh, this is a letter that we wrote to the AAR in December of 2014 about a, a well site that was um, going in near our home. We requested the appropriate on and off site monitoring as directed under AAAQO and, dir and Directive 60. Mm -hmm. It was not provided. The AAR allowed that company not to provide that air quality monitoring. In the six well sites around our home, there was no on or off site appropriate air quality monitoring done. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering um, how you're going to go forward and make the industry um, apply and and be um, do the appropriate air quality monitoring as directed by ambient air quality objectives for each and every well site that is it's actually listed under Directive 60. So if you're um, a non-government, you know, you're mm -hmm. an arms length agency, why are you not addressing all these point source emissions? Around our home, we had over 50 million liters of negligent emissions being generated each month for years on end. And we had no air quality monitoring whatsoever. We did our own in January of, 2000, um, January of 2015 this year through the UFC and we found benzene concentrations five times that of the city of Calgary. We had to pay for that air quality monitoring ourselves. So that's part of the challenge of the way the system is, and, and I need to just explain again, our role is that we're based on the science, and we're not, as an arms like the agency that is founded in science to be able to give that source of data, how we could hope to help in that sort of circumstance is to be able to give you the air monitoring data and help give you information that comes from that source that they would consider. We can't necessarily, and we don't have any role in play, creating policy or enforcing anything. That again is the regulatory component, is the enforcement or the compliance, and then the policy side is the government side. What, um, in, in similar, there's a lot of situations um, like yours, um, but everyone's is not as important as yours because it's to your, your circumstance. But in all of these different times, like in, 
First Nations have similar concerns because they don't necessarily trust the information that's coming in. They don't trust the source of it. They want to have that understanding. And they think that there's information that is being withheld from them deliberately from that perspective. So that's where the transparency will come in to be able to do things. And we're trying to empower then all of you to be able to help influence and get that policy. Our design is to be able to have one, become one comprehensive source that everybody trusts. But that said, we have the ability to be able to ask questions beyond from that. So if there's a concern in the region, having an understanding of that, looking at it within your airshed, working with your local airshed, and then them, us bringing it forward can be able to help arm you with some information to that. Um, again, we're focused on the science and getting, making sure that the data is there to be able to help emphasize that or to validate it. But it's not necessarily, we don't have the enforcement capability to go to an organization and say, you have to do it. The data has to show, and the results and the evaluation have to show. So as we strengthen the evaluation, hopefully those kind of situations will at least have a process that they can be effectively managed. No. There's two different sources, of, but the non-point, like where, and so organizations like, the, and the Clean Air Strategic Alliance is also going to be talking about non-point source stuff moving forward. But it is, um, those pieces of information complement each other. So we look at then the impact from a broader perspective. We don't look at what specific cause, we're looking at that there is a problem in the area and the ambient will pick up on that. So then it needs to be refined and defined down from that. But that's not a mayor's role. It's our role to help provide the broader, this is the impact that's happening in this area. There is a problem, we flag the problem. Question in the back. Right now I'm enjoying a glass of water here. And oh. there's a very good chance that I'm uh, drinking treated water. But if the minute I move outside urban Alberta, there's a realistic chance I'm gonna be drinking raw water, mm -hmm. even though it is potable. So my question is, what's the state of raw water consumption in the province? Are you, is that part of your mandate to monitor that? And what needs to be improved for like dealing with raw water consumption in the province? Um, water is probably, I've worked in uh, with water research for many years and looking at that. And water is something that we're maintaining that we have, that's where the expertise in the surface water quality, that is an, a, a thing that we've directly inherited and that's the majority of the 50 people I talked about, that's what they do and work in that area. There is, um, I can't, I'm not a scientist, so I can't stand and say what the state of the water quality is, but I do know that um, all of our programs are being driven around it and there is a ton of information that is available on water quality, but the evaluation of it and bringing it forward needs to be done. Um, different river basins have different perspectives, but the regional approach that we're taking is all driven around water and the river basins. I can't answer your question specifically about what the state of raw water is in this province, but that is probably where we're investing the majority of our research um, in terms of water is on, quant there's a quantity component, but the quality is really what's lacking in doing that. And again, I stress that groundwater is an area that we're tackling fairly quickly and um, aggressively with a plan, working with about two or three other major partners, including academic institutions. I... Question in front here. Don't, Hi. but I would not advise going out and dipping it in the lake just in uh -huh. case. So. <laughs> Check our website. Hi, I'm wondering, maybe you mentioned this and I just missed it. Are you going to be measuring air and water yourself, like Amira itself, or are you going to be analyzing data collected from airsheds, watersheds, industry, AER, other sources? Which way? It'll be a combination of the two. So as I said, the water is something that we currently have the majority of responsibility for because that came directly. That was a responsibility of government, and that's primarily been transferred across to us directly. So we're taking the lead and managing that because that's, that's the entity that was doing the majority of that. However, there are some water uh, WPACs that are doing some work in that area that we need to start working together and doing that. Um, the air sheds, so it's gonna be a bit of a hybrid as we get a better understanding. Again, there are dozens, if not a couple hundred organizations and entities that have environmental data and are doing environmental monitoring activities. There's no way that we could just as one organization do it all. We need to find and leverage off the work that's being done. But the key part of it is, is that there's a filter that needs to be done, that there's a quality and assurance 
from a science perspective that that's the oversight we need to bring to it. It is going to take time. I mean, it took 30 to 40 years to get us to this point, and the knowledge base uh, from environment is evolving daily, if not hourly, if not moment by moment, and we're getting a better understanding with every piece of information we have. So it's going to take time to, to shift and to pull all that stuff together. And the relationship piece shouldn't be underestimated. There's a lot of people who are doing really great work in this province and just want to continue to work that way. But as you move with continuous improvement, you're working things forward. Again, I'm fairly optimistic because where we're the, first, the furthest in discussions is with the air sheds in terms of the relationship. Do we have all the answers of who's doing what yet? Not at all. But the important part is we start the relationship and the discussion and we start sharing the data and start looking at it. Our intention is to be as open as possible as an organization, even in how we're operating, to be able to get to the results and the approach we need to do. We got one more, one, one for the road, very good. Um, thank you for holding that. Um, I'm a little bit concerned about the magnitude of the effort. Uh, right now you must so have we. a budget to work with. <laughs> And you've got a large province with a lot of monitoring. I come from the environmental monitoring business. Mm -hmm. That's expensive. And I'm just wondering how we, uh, your strategic approach will be. What magnitude do you think this is going to get to before you can give results to the public that have a meaning and you can give it back to the processes that need to use it for assessment? Because I really think that's a challenge to do in a, uh, a blanket approach. It's a huge challenge. And, and again, I, I often say, even around the office, like, I don't want to be sounding apologetic, because the expectations are extremely high. And the, the, the challenge of just even understanding the current landscape of all of the stuff that's going on, as well as then the emerging need of what are the things that you need to do. So. Um, it is, uh, you know, as I often say, just even in the simplest things, is like we're looking at the whole elephant and thinking, how the heck am I going to eat that thing? And you eat an elephant one bite at a time. So we have to start doing an incremental sections of where there's the highest need. So where we've got the most experience, the most technology, and the most focus right now is in the lower Athabasca region. So that's where we've also got the most funding. So there's lots of parties. There is three years of actually starting to try to pull it together. More work needs to be done to tighten it up because um, you know, we, just, we just conducted like a science review. I haven't seen it, but I understand that it makes the observation that it, it does, we, we, we're not focused enough on outcomes. So we have to start with the outcome discussion and then start to fill in the pieces of how they fit within that framework. It is a, it's a massive effort, and as I said, we, it's not going to happen overnight. It's the transformation of a whole way of thinking. And it's not unique to Alberta, by the way, is that this is happening everywhere in terms of environmental discussions. There are some really good examples, which is why we're bringing in the International Advisory Panel to be able to give us and pull in some of the expertise that are doing. Um, one organization that we're looking a lot at that's probably one of the more advanced in terms of how they collect and manage and look at the data from an environmental monitoring perspective is the US Geological Survey. They've at least got systems and they've got about 150 to 160 years of experience of managing and doing that as kind of a, an arm's length entity of, of setting that up. So there's a lot of lessons to be learned, but it, it's, it's gonna be a huge effort. There's no question. And um, you know, the question always is, you know, what's the provincial province's commitment to seeing it through? It's the right thing to do, I firmly believe. It. That's why I am happy to be there to try to make a difference to do things. But, I mean, nothing's easy. If it was easy, it would already be being done, right? So thanks for the question. Uh, Val, um, we, we, uh, we sincerely appreciate uh, taking time to, to share a fairly new gig for you and a fairly new organization. Uh, we wish you well in, in, this, uh, in this giant uh, undertaking. And on behalf of everyone from Synergy, thank you very much for sharing your thoughts this morning. And thank you for your attention.